Let's do this. Let's do it. Woo! All right. I'm pumped. I'm pumped as well. All right. Five, four, three, two, one. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. We are sitting down with Eric Matzner. Howdy. What's up, brother? Thanks for What's coming up, on to the show. Greatly appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having me. As you guys know, we like to take very complicated subjects and make them more relatable for people and inspire you to build with them. So today we're going to be talking about nootropics. We're going to be talking about enhancing the mind. <laughs> we'll be uh, talking a bit about um, climate mitigation as well, some Mitigating sustainability. Mitigating climate change, yes. Yes, yes. So um, let's start unpacking. So you've been doing nootropics now uh, with your company, Neutro, and you guys have been doing this for four years now. That's correct. Yeah. So yeah, we started, uh, you know, back four years ago, nootropics were much lesser known, but they were kind of coming uh, out of the internet where the biohackers were picking up where science had left off. In the 70s, the uh, research had originated, and, uh, but a lot of it, while there was some unhealthy people, kind of didn't really focus on totally optimizing like work productivity or uh, memory and learning in healthy people. And so when these forums kind of came together, they started putting all this knowledge there, but it was very difficult. And to some, some extent, it is still fairly difficult yeah. to s properly source where you know what you're getting. Back then, everything came in like mylar bags direct from China. And you're like, uh, am I gonna like die from taking this? So uh, people would group together and do purity tests and things like that, things like that. And so that's kind of where Neutrop my company came from was to do the tests. You need to order a certain quantity and then you need to, uh, it doesn't make sense because it'd be multi-year supply or like that you would even the quantity to get tested sometimes. So uh, centralize that by doing that and also allowing me access to the patented pure ingredients that individuals couldn't get themselves either. So, mm. So this is this is interesting. There's this whole birth movement that was occurring, did you say in the 70s? Well, the nootropics originally came out in the 70s, but the real biohackers and these forums yeah. and Longa City and the subreddits of nootropics came about in like the last five or 10, five, or five, ten five to six years. But, yeah. So that's like more of, okay, so nootropics earlier in the 70s, but then the biohacker movement and all the subreddits and everything very more recently, five, 10 years. But I, I'm really, this is new. This is like 40 years of just being like, how do we enhance? enhance the human mind with nootropics and this is an exciting time of like you said putting together the right and testing to testing that over and over again on different people and seeing what ends up happening um, let's actually go through some of the science um, yeah. and what you and what you pulled up because and what you're going to show us and teach us today because I think this kind of is a good segue into it yes so I so I just wrote a book or I'm in the process of final, finalizing it's called the history of nootropics uh, from plants to paracetam so I like to like, this is part one, there's gonna be a part two, it's about all the different nootropics, part three is about like the ethics of human cognitive enhancement, but this one focuses on like, why do molecules that plants make work in our brain? How have they shaped the course of human evolution? And then how did we get uh, chemistry? How did plants affect other molecules, affect history and change the world, I think a lot for the better. And then how we got to nootropics uh, is kind of like the, the gist of it. So if you want to jump into that, let's go ahead. I love the idea that humans ate plants and that the plants altered our mind um, and certain plants would enhance our mind. So yeah, let's dive into this. Let's dive in. So if we look at the human brain, um, is that the first? The well, first the human slide? brain, yeah, the human brain start is in evolution, there's fits and spurts. And so uh, and should this, we, pull up the first we should pull up the first okay, slide, yeah. And so if we look at um, something called exaptation, which is this other, there's this a is your product, product. There's yeah, our product, and, yeah. And then, and then you got a, um, you got the next one is also, it's the back, is it the back side, the next one? The next slide should yeah. be, uh, or, so one more. And then, okay, so that's gonna be the, oh, this is, so what is the nootropic? Cool. Yeah, so this is like what I cover in the book, but just a nootropic out there is, so it's something that enhances learning and memory while being safe and protective of the brain. It has to be like non-toxic and also like prevent you from concussions or strokes when you lose oxygen. Um, and just being towards higher level uh, cognitive ability, which we'll go into in a bit. So let's roll the next slide here. And, and yeah, it being non-toxic, like you said, is crucial. Is crucial. Yeah. If, 
if so there's a difference between a cognitive enhancer and a nootropic real quick is that a cognitive enhancer could make you smarter right now while you take it but kill you tomorrow and it would still be a cognitive enhancer whereas a nootropic if it has negative side effects not a nootropic anymore. Gotcha. So like an amphetamine. An amphetamine, yes. It leaves you worse off with lower dopamine levels and kind of strung out yeah. um, because you flush out the dopamine instead of recycling it. So uh, an amphetamine like an Adderall or something like that is not considered a nootropic. It would be that's a central nervous stimulant among other things, but also uh, maybe a cognitive enhancer, but not necessarily a nootropic. It's not a two-way street. Because it's, it's not non-toxic. Exactly. All nootropics are cognitive enhancers by definition, but not all cognitive enhancers are nootropics. nootropics. Interesting. Yes. So if we look yeah. at like the evolution of the human brain size, we can pinpoint actually that human brain evolution was spurred by our ability and access of marine resources, meaning fish with a molecule called DHA in yeah. there. So DHA is like part of fish oils, DHA and EPA. Yep. Um, and DHA is a limiting factor in brain size. So if you look here, this is um, the amount of DHA for different animals. And so you can see like- Wow, squirrels are high. <laughs> squirrels are high because they're small and they're eating like nuts and things. Oh, and they're eating nuts, yes, which and, have DHA? Which have some DHA, have uh -huh. omegas in them. And the, but the, we cannot get uh, from grass, we as humans can't extract the DHA. And so, uh, we eat animals that eat algae or the fish, for example, but like cows yeah. are ruminants. They have four stomachs. They eat grass. They vomit it up to so something called cud and then they so, eat it again yeah, yeah. and they get the DHA. And that's when we eat a cow, we get the DHA out of it. Yeah, but yeah. what happens is the protein in animals, their bodies grow, but their brains stay relatively the small size. So humans are uh, an, an out of an example where we keep high DHA content in our brain. And if you looked actually a dolphin would be somewhere right here, like right under humans because they're eating fish all day. So their brains have grown in a similar way. Interesting. So the part of human evolution that has to do with us fishing and eating f the DHA oil in fish yes. had to do with what specific uh, aspect of brain development? So this is so in evolution, most people talk about survival of the fittest, but exaptation is this idea that something occurs and then what flows from that. Yeah. So because we had fish resources, and if you look at humans, typically we have this savanna hypothesis, which is like, we were in the savanna, no. We're actually, the aquatic ape hypothesis went a little too far, but it's yeah. much closer to accurate. Yeah. If you look at humans, we don't have, a, we have sweat glands, we have, uh, we do not have, I'm sorry, we have, savanna dwellers do not have sweat glands, they don't have subcutaneous fat, they don't, uh, they have fur to reflect the sunlight, we don't have that. We would be poorly surviving in a savanna. So if you look, we also, things like- I our, don't know what you're talking about, I got some fur. You, to, you to could survive in savanna, <laughs> savanna, I think. I got some reflection. You could, you could reflect. <laughs> But if you look at like weird things in our biology that tell us that we definitely spent a lot of time evolving water, when your hands prune, for example, it's not because you're like in the water too long, it's because that increases your grip. So that's an evolutionary It uh, increases trait. your grip. Yeah. So the point of the fingers becoming uh, the, like a Prune, pruned yeah, like is, is for the is grip. to increase grip yeah, it while gives you're more, underwater. more friction, yeah, when you're underwater. Because we were like hanging out in water, hunting in water. If you go to Africa, all the animals have to come to the water and you just kill them right there. So it made a lot of sense that we'd hang, we can't go that far from water. Yeah. We can have giant containers and ways to transport water, dig wells. So it makes sense that humans stayed by the water. And then Which that, is where we evolved from yeah, and, the and reason, then captured yeah. fish and yeah, exactly. gained mental increase. Exactly, so okay. our brains grew and then from that you get like symbolic consciousness where we start making art and music and all these things. Our brain is growing so much that it has like extra nutrients to like do extra stuff. So you'd say that the DHA is... DHA and AA are those two limiting factors and anachronistic okay. acid has another source. DHA really can only be found in like the grass and in algae and in yeah, fish. Yeah, so yeah. like we cannot eat grass and get it. So that's what causes like huge growth in our brain. You, uh, you would attribute a decent amount yes. of the evolutionary, like are we talking of, over 50%? We're, we're, talk, we're talking about from uh, Homo, to, where we get to Homo sapiens is like from this fit DHA. You, you yeah. think so, There's a yeah. book called Human Brain Evolution. That, yeah. This is where this chart is from. And so is that one that you can- get And it's like, that. they're like pretty certain that- They're pretty certain. The part of the that's evidence that's crazy. lacking is that when we live by the shore, the settlements got washed away. So in the archeological evidence, they don't find a ton of uh, things by the rivers and by the, they've washed away. So, but there is a large uh, shift in the understanding of yeah. human evolution based on available marine uh, resources. And if you look at what's needed in the human brain, this is the only way you could get it is by eating a lot of fish.
So let's roll the next slide roll. here. Yeah. Human history is so fascinating, Yeah, it's dude. nuts. <laughs> um, so then we go back. We're going to go back in time a little bit to like the plants, and we're going to look at where plants and humans are all eukaryote plants. Animals are all eukaryotes. So we share this common ancestor, and a lot of the major genes in our body we share with those. So we have 23,000 genes, 3,400 go to that same ancestor. So similarly with the plants, there's 3,000 of these common ones. And that's like where our body regulates uh, the different neurotransmitters. Plants use neurotransmitters, the same ones we have, to do different things and to like mm -hmm. cause chemical reactions and, and do things. They're not really like thinking per se, but mm -hmm. if you imagine but that- But they have to take sunlight and grow and do And convert and stuff. If you yeah. hit the next slide, there's actually a cool chart here. And so, the plants are in this like epic struggle between uh, herbivores eating them and between like they need to be pollinated. Most of the plants are gynostema. They have st uh, seeds that need to be moved or uh, pollen that needs to be moved by bugs. So there, some bugs are helping them. Some animals are helping them and some are trying to eat them. So, yeah, plants, so they're like, don't, don't eat me. And then it's like spread my seed. Yes. And then some of the insects will help the seed. Get exactly. Spread. So like it, a good example is like caffeine, for example, is a molecule we're going to look at more in depth, but caffeine for green, like for like worms and stuff, it's a poison. So when they eat it, it short circuits their brain. And so for, but if you look at like the flowers and the like places that where the bees go, uh, with the nectar and stuff, there's lower levels of caffeine, not enough to like kill the bug, but to, what, is, what does caffeine do in us? Boosts our memory, gives us a nice little buzz, so the bees are getting an extra buzz, and they're buzzing around, going to the plant, and that memory enhancement actually makes the plant, the bug, remember where it got high, and it comes back to that plant. So there's a, that's, but it's also, again, a toxin to the lower level bugs. So it's doing this dual purpose. And you so can, it kills worms. So it kills the, like, and, but it stimulates pollinators. Bees. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, you know, we had, uh, air, um, um, uh, Matthias on our show. Um, he was really interesting. He was engineering, um, bees to become more, uh, to become better at their jobs. Oh yeah, for, I saw that guy, the presentation. At yeah, yeah. Indie Bio. At Indie Bio, yeah. 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 yeah, how interesting is that? It's super interesting uh, to train wild animals to be more effective, or I forgot, what were they giving them? They're giving them something or doing something to change their behavior? Yeah, I don't exactly remember, but how freaking interesting is the bee as part of this ecosystem? And so wait, the, the, ne the nectar, um, the pollen has a little bit of caffeine in yeah, it? Yeah, well in the parts of the plants, yes, where it's getting that nectar. So the, that molecule slots in the bee's brain is actually very similar to ours. And there's papers about how bee and insect bra bee brain specifically can be used in studies to mimic as a mimetic for a human brain. Um, so there's, there's those slots that it fits into are very similar. Like adenosine is very similar in shape to the coffee molecule. And I believe, by the way, the one point before I go here, because I think we have the pictures of the images on the next slide, is like if you look at other drugs, for example, like heroin, um, can you go back one real quick? So if you look at like heroin, for example, uh, the opiate in the plant, what does it do in humans? It makes us like sleepy, not hungry. Uh, you don't want to procreate. So if you, if a bug is a predator and it's coming to eat you and you now drug it so it doesn't reproduce, oh. it doesn't become hungry, it does the exact same thing in bugs that it does in humans. That's why I don't recommend taking heroin. It's literally trying to eliminate you from the gene pool and stop you from being productive. Um, so wow, it's like a, when you talk about it that way, yeah, that, yeah that's, uh, that, then that makes a little bit m more sense of reasons. Why the mo those molecules are made. And you can kind of see that yeah. in almost every, so those are called secondary metabolites. Those are things that the plants are making that aren't necessary for their, their to live, which is like a primary metabolite. Um, speaking of wealth inequality and speaking of uh, people being very uh, addicted to heroin and them uh, being more just like, you know, and not wanting to reproduce or not wanting to make, make something into the world um, and that being a reason of, uh, of their genes getting out of the pool, um, that's a pretty crazy it's kind of wild. It's kind of wild because we have some of that going on right here in SF. Uh, yeah. yeah, you can trace like all the drugs. There's a book called Plants in the Human Brain that has, uh, K uh, Kennedy as the author, has all the different plant uh, drugs and why the plant makes it, why, why it slots in our brain. So you do go to the next slide now, you can see that uh, adenosine looks very similar to caffeine and shape-wise. And that the simple way that caffeine works to keep us awake is that 
Adenosine is like a bank deposit of tiredness. And when your bank account is full, you're tired. And so your brain, while you're awake, it's constantly releasing adenosine receptors. And as those slots are all full, then you go to sleep. And that's so what happens. In the morning, no adenosine. Exactly. Like you as you sleep, you reset it, basically. That's part of why caffeine stops working on you as you are like awake for a long time. So once the caffeine molecule goes in there, it blocks the adenosine. And so that's why it works. And so if you look at these shapes, we're going to see in a little bit. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, is that co so coffee so some slides missing here in general from the book no, but no, but no. coffee so the history of coffee is real quick is that it was found in ethiopia in the desert there's a couple different origin stories yeah that about a goat herder who was out in the thing and his goats ate these berries and they got super energized and so he like was like what is this and that's coffee or a guy who was sent to his death in the desert he found the coffee plant got so stimulated he was able to survive and then that was like a you know religious thing wow so it kind of like made its way in the arab world <laughs> But they don't allow alcohol, and there was like being there for that first moment of like understanding coffee and caffeine, and now caffeine and coffee is all over all the over, world yeah. for like two dollars for a little tiny cup yeah. at every single restaurant and cafe. It's yeah. just nuts it's, how that happened. It's pretty nuts how coffee. So yeah, so the the way that that happened is the coffee. So it was like banned on and off in the in the middle uh, in Africa in the Muslim countries, and then it went to like Amsterdam. And then it made its way, uh, you know, they have one plant, a couple plants only. They got started getting it and they bred them. Then eventually when it makes its way to England, it actually has the hugest effect like in London. And uh, for example, uh, prior water, which you're drinking right now, we can praise water mm -hmm. that we have clean, mm -hmm. nice water here. Mm -hmm. um, but in the 16, 1700s, Water, pure water was a luxury and so yep. the town wells they would have like dead bodies they didn't know about microbes and germs oh, yeah. but they knew if you drank the water you would get sick and it could be like tainted and so people use boiled or fermented drinks and so a lot of yeah. times people were drinking alcohol all day when you beer like low dose beer low dose wine was like the drink of water so ever you can imagine a city everybody's drunk b before lunchtime and so like this is what when coffee comes here's in the 1798 these guys are saying, here's one in 1660. So uh, the coffee drink hath caused a greater sobriety among the nations, whereas <laughs> formerly apprentices and clerks with others used to take a morning draught of ale, beer, or wine, which by the dizziness they cause in the brain, being drunk, made for many unfit for business. They now use the good fellow in this wakeful and civil drink. So coffee was the great coffee the sober drink, the mighty nourishment of the brain, which unlike other spirits, heightens purity and lucidity. Coffee, which clears the clouds of imagination and their gloomy weight, which illuminates the reality of things suddenly with the flash of truth. So coffee literally brightened us and brought us the enlightenment. And if you go to the next slide here. Because we used to also drink for in the morning when we were, because we didn't have clean water. And then that would make us actually more cloudy uh, for business and for trying to build things versus coffee, which would keep us very alert and vigilant in building these things. So this was a major ramp up in productivity. Major change in productivity. But then the, what's cool is the societal effects occur because of the culture of the coffee at coffee houses. So... Uh, whereas before you'd go to these like dark bars and be drinking, now you're going to coffee shops and getting drinking the coffee, being stimulated, and having conversations. And instead of just like being drunk and blah blah blah, you're actually like stimulated, and the people together are being stimulated more. And so uh, you can actually trace like uh, Newton's theory of gravity, relativity principle. It comes mm. from a conversation started in one coffee shop, continued in another one, and that's how we got theory of gravity. Lloyd's of London, wow. the insurance market. Was a rigid, Lloyd's was a coffee shop. New cool. Jonathan's was a stock exchange. There was a place called Jonathan's that got kicked out. They're like, screw you, we're gonna make our own. New Jonathan's. So each coffee shop had its own kind of like vibe to it. And like there was times when we didn't even have names for different like fields, but it was like everyone in that coffee shop is like doing weird math, math. or doing like <laughs> weird like physics. physics. And so you kind of would just go That's there so and there funny. was like newspapers were named after the things as well and they would distribute them there. And what was cool is that, and why they became like stock exchange type of places because anyone from different classes, a guy from the, especially in the class society, you couldn't, the lords and the nobles wouldn't be with like the lower level people, excuse me. <clears throat> and the, uh, when you have the coffee shop, the sailors would come right in from the port smelling like fish and gross and sit with the businessmen and do deals. And so 
they became these places of exchange and these like centers That's of all so sorts of awesome stuff. Yeah, I I, I love the <coughs> the history of coffee and how it ramped up like productivity, and I just really love immersing myself into. Uh, older time periods in history because I kind of romanticize uh, at least living in them for a short bit of time just so that we could really experience what went on in those times because how interesting would it be to be without the phone and the computer and all the satellites and everything for just a little bit and just sit there and just observe what pe how people are engaging in the present moment and how they're what Yo, they're if you went to through. France you could have hung out with Voltaire, Locke and Diderot and Franklin were all hanging in the same <laughs> coffee shops and artists and a lot of things were going on so this was like a central pivot there's even next slide I don't know if we have the war one in here but uh, coffee in the Civil mm. War was like the, the South was blockaded and they didn't have coffee and they didn't know the, the caffeine molecule, what, what exactly it was. They knew that the plant had something in it, but uh, they were, there's some argument that like the South lost the Civil War because they were like drinking dirt. They didn't have any coffee and they were like trying to find mm. a caffeine stimulant. Whereas like the North in part of the rations was uh, coffee and hardtack, which is like a bread they would like dip into the coffee. And that was like the rations every day they were given that. And there's more references in letters home from Civil War soldiers referencing coffee than bullets or like anything like wow. fighting related. Like they were like, it really spread the habit uh, out. Um, and so around this time in... Ochem. What? Yeah. Okay. This is how we actually get... So this is another cool side history note of how pursuit of one thing got us something else. That's so cool. And so at the time, uh, we didn't have organic uh, sim uh, synthetic chemistry. And so colors were made it naturally. So purple was very expensive. It was like mollusk shells that had to be like gr fished, then ground up. And only the royals could really use purple, or like war purple. Wow. And so around this time, the queen of, queen of in France wore a purple dress and it also happened at the same time the, the ta first tabloids that were like being distributed around Europe so when that dress and that color like made it in everybody was like I want this how do we get it and so there was like a, a scientist went and was like should I make uh, quinine for malaria or should I make a color fortunately he cho here he chose a color and uh, that color became mauve and it became purple and there was like a race to the patent office to get it done and, uh, and how did synthetic chemistry of the color purple give birth from so coffee? So I don't know if we have a slide with all the different molecules. Do you have a slide with molecule shapes next? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hit next there. So the, remember that adenosine receptor and that caffeine? They, here al alizarin is red, al alarazin is red. Uh, it is just like those molecules. So the molecules they were getting from coal amine. So in coal and tar amines, they were like taking out and there's like dark purples and blacks and, and reds in there. And so they looked very much and they found that some of them had like drug properties. They would do these things. So in making those colors, they started like figuring out some of these molecular shapes or processes and they would do a chemical reaction and it would turn out red, it would turn out purple. And so they started having these like races to the patent office. So in Germany- From coffee? From the fashion color. This is separate from coffee This now. is separate Yeah, from we've coffee. moved on. From, from the fashion color? From the color purple what, yeah. started this organic yeah, chemistry. Yeah, yeah, but what led to the color purple? What was the coffee to purple first uh, and the, then to well, red Well, coffee black was and, separate. was just like how the yeah. molecules affect us. Then in around the same time in 1780s. So synthetic color um, or synthetic chemistry and color was, is different from It's different coffee. from coffee. Okay. Yeah, sorry if that wasn't oh, clear. Okay, We're missing okay. a few slides yeah. for the shortened <laughs> talk here. But um, so, yeah, so this okay. is the next twist, which is how in the history we're going from like what we had in plants that were good to now can we start making our own things for the first time. Molecules that may not exist in science that we're gonna synthesize. So they started making those colors. They found, and so what happened is- In a much more effective way, synthesizing Yeah, it. synthesizing okay. them instead of from the natural sources. And so they were like racist to the patent office. Like red was like, they gave the patent to two groups because one was like the night before and one was the next day. And so they're like, shit, we need to scale up our process and so they went to the universities and like scientists like will pay you to figure out the next colors the new colors and that is what started the industrial drug design process that's still in effect today and if you look at like all the german uh chemical industry companies yeah. from bayer to uh, merck and all these other ones they all started in germany right around the time making colors 
making colors yeah. and patenting colors. And which patent now colors. you so, can't patent colors. Uh, well, you could then because they were like new structures and they were like uh, they were synthetically made, and so you could patent colors. Bayer won the 1905 Nobel Prize for making indigo. For making indigo. For making cool. indigo. But so, today, no more color patents. I'm sure. So, I'm sure there's still color patents out there. I mean, Pantone sells colors, and there's patented colors of different uh, stripes. Trying to use color, like to make that gold bottle, I have to give a fact, uh, that's a custom color that I, is like made in a paint factory. And actually every time they do the batch, it comes out a little bit different. Um, hmm. So it's uh, color is very hard to translate color globally. That's why they have a Pantone system, um, which is kind of crazy. So, so how do you communicate a color to somebody? It's a picture, has different yeah. lighting. It's like that blue and gold dress, dress you know, yeah, like yeah. you never know. Let's, so, let's keep hustling. Let's keep through. on this. Yeah. So we go to the next thing. So we got, so I like just in that one, the, the sum of that is that in pursuit of fashion, which you can make, you know, people try to belittle fashion without fashion and pursuit of like that creative creativity and color in life, we would not have drug development. So don't ever let anyone talk down the importance of fashion. Okay. Um, That's a good point. There you yeah. go. Um, and so what's scary or weird when you start to look at neuroscience and just science in general is how early we are and, and like relatively new. Like the word neuroscience wasn't used until 1963 at MIT to describe a lab there. So we're like 50 years in, 50 something years into neuroscience. Um, and so in 1950, they discovered GABA as a neurotransmitter. So the quick thing is we're gonna talk about neurotransmitters a bunch is that a neurotransmitter is how the brain fires from one synapse, across a synapse to, to make something happen, to make a connection in the brain, to cause a cascade that flows through the brain. And so most of them stimulate on and tell the brain to send a signal on. And so this thing that was called factor I for inhibition was like the first known uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter. This guy, Ed Flory, discovered it, Ernst Flory. And so they were like trying to figure out what the heck this thing was. And so then they isolated it. Finally, in 1963, they figured out that what it was. They called it GABA. And then we go to the next slide, and we see labs all around the world working on creating derivatives that were patentable for inhibiting the brain, such as a sleep aid. So this place in Belgium, UCB Pharma, they were synthesizing all different derivatives of this, and one of them, called UCB6215, became known as paracetam. So it's a cyclical derivative of GABA, meaning they modified this existing neurotransmitter and got out this nice little uh, 2-oxopyrolidine structure. So we go to the next slide. Um, we can see, so when you're making a molecule, you It's interesting that they went directly to sleep first. Well, because GABA was inhibiting, so they thought it was related to sleep, and GABA is implemented, implicated in sleep in some ways as well. But they thought, oh, if this stops reactions, if this slows down, maybe we can make the brain go to sleep. So, but when they do these things, and UCB6215 was one in a number of lines, like LSD25, 25 has nothing to do with the chemical structure. It was a 25th version derivative of ergot that they made. Mm -hmm. So uh, th then you get a formal name normally. LSD doesn't really have one. Um, and so uh, this is one of the studies that they did on the batch of Can chemicals. Can just quick stop at neurotransmitter as well? So where does the initial, pul the, the initial pulse or signal go to the first neuron that fires? Because then the, that neuron will send the neurotransmitter across the synapse to the other neuron, which will then cascade the signal. So w when your brain receives information, it's trying to integrate it into like the basis you have of like your, your neural structure. So if you know about neuroscience, my brain's gonna like activate those neurons and start to branch out from there. And even as I'm repeating this, it's firing to like link together the information to bring up the next word that I'm gonna say and things like that. Are those like that. neurons, uh, where do they hold the information for your knowledge That's up for debate. Just last week they, okay. they took a snail and they shocked it and then they took mRNA out of it and put it into another snail and that snail acted as if it had been shocked. So we're, it's, it's not entirely clear exactly where a memory exists, although the like memory, for example, is formed in the hippocampus, in the um, subventricle zone. There's these like beautiful uh, neurons that like seem to be involved in uh, wayfinding and uh, like remembering where your camp is, remembering where that lion is, you know, so that in evolution you would not make a mistake. It's like those things that would stick out seem to be much uh, easier to remember, whereas like the prefrontal cortex, the front of our brain up here, seemed to evolve later, and that was for more like theories of mind where I'm thinking like, what am I gonna tell uh, Alan tomorrow? Like my, that's thinking into advance is like a kind of different area. Yeah, so, 
So near the hippocampus is, is more of this for this path of like where is the information where am I going to go and fire exactly and, and, and figure it out and then versus prefrontals like plan yeah and just things to remember so here's okay. one of the experiments that they did I kind of want to um, take a nootropic yeah take one yeah uh, I think get I, in there I should I can re up um, so I'll show you there's the two so here we have two different formulas in mind a gold and a silver and so uh, Put some out on the table. Yeah, think. let's do it. Let's uh, <laughs> and uh, so the gold, so the gold is something called Nupet, which is a thousand times stronger than the paracetam, and the silver was something called phenylparacetam, which is a. These are beautiful, by the way. Thank these you. Are, these are well done, well these made. These are custom, non-artificial colors, and. Uh, yeah, we'll put them up. Uh, the reason they're gold and silver is because uh, when I first started, I didn't have the scale to have custom, non-artificial color capsules made and I used actual gold and silver flakes. Yeah, yeah. That's why the bottle's gold and we're the gold standard gold is because it was like, we're high quality. And I was like importing gold from this German company that Goldschlager gets their gold from. <laughs> um, so yeah, these will make sense to explain in a little bit, but if you want to be a little bit quicker, I would go with the silver one. If you want to be like deeper into the focus, I'd go with the gold one cool. probably. Um, all right, so you want to go deeper. Um, so it will take a little while to dissolve, but hope, hope probably by the end of the thing, it'll yeah. be active. and. Uh, you can, uh, you'll we'll show a cat uh, corpus callosum and we'll show how, what's going on in your brain activity cool. in a second. But so this is how they discovered the memory retaining properties of the brain, which is they put these rats in a little cage. Just quick, I know this is gonna get us yeah. deeper into science and I just wanna make sure that people at home know a little bit more about what just happened. So um, these you guys are selling right now. Yeah. Um, and they're, uh, is it 50? About fifty to sixty bucks. 50, if you subscribe versus bucks. you take a one-time bottle. One time, one bottle is thirty-five pills or how thirty many? pills. Thirty, thirty. Fifteen pills. gold, fifteen silver. Fifteen gold, fifteen silver, and then um, and you then alternate between you, them. You every day you alternate between gold and silver, um, and then the gold and silver are slightly different formulas, and we're uh, we'll unpack the. Yeah, we're gonna unpack it. I think it's better to go into that when we get to the slides that show the combination. Check this out because, you know, one of the most important things to do in your life is to treat yourself like a science experiment. Because if we're going to be so, so cautious all the time and never attempt any uh, sort of uh, quantified self on us, we got to try things, see how it feels and how it quantifies in us, and then just go forth and change uh, if we want to keep doing something. Maybe we don't. How do we want to augment and enhance the human mind as we do it? So, you know, always be willing to at least try something and see how it, it goes. It seems for safe. You. I mean, you have to admit, I'm like in age or die trying and I try some experimental <laughs> things where I have to use this equation in my mind where I'm like, based on the evidence I see here, is this thing possibly going to increase my risk of mortality? Because I've taken like an extract from the pineal gland that like Whoa. potentially like regulates your biological clock. And I'm saying to my followers on Instagram, whatever, like, if you want to know if this works, follow me for the next 80 years. <laughs> you yeah, know, it's yeah, like, yeah. it's, it's concern. You have to be careful. But at the same time, I know that if I do nothing, I'm going to die. I'm going to age. I'm going to like degenerate. And so at some point, like the, inf the information the peak of your activity during the day, like taking a nootropic may actually help you execute faster and more thoroughly and get more things done during the day. So time is the most valuable resource. And if you can achieve more in less time than other people, yeah. that's very impressive. Or even in the same time, if you can achieve more in the same time as other people, that's also very impressive. That's why I'm a big believer in meta learning, which is when people say, what do you do with your nootropics? I say, I learned how to learn. And so I read books exactly. like had first 20 hours, how to learn anything much more rapidly. Yep. I've increased, I look at the limitation on, on computer systems is IO, input and output. So yeah, I yeah. learned how to, t one of the first things I did exactly. when I was increasing my uh, brain is I started relearning how to type. I got a Kinesis uh, keyboard yeah, and I could type guy, 150, yeah. I'm a 99.9 .9 percentile typist. I could type 150 words a minute, easily 130. Um, peak like 180 if I'm really at it. And then uh, I also learned how to speed read, whereas at, which we yep, did, which we did, we did where the average reading speed is about 200 to 300 words a minute. 
and a college press is about 500, and you saw me hitting like 900 to 1,000, yeah. which is like I was keeping up with you a little bit at so that, you were like doing, 600 You were doing like 600, level. yeah, you were keeping there. Up. It was, Anybody it was can fun. read at 600, not to take away from your achievement, but it, with a yeah, little bit of totally. training where you go faster than slower, exactly. then you go even faster than a little bit more slower, and you kind of can ratchet up. And this is the word just appearing, like the of and to which um, the yes. study of professor The rapid serial shows. visual presentation, RSVP reading, and there's an algorithm by a company called Spritz where they like added pauses after periods and commas, so they made it so you can go even faster, which has been knocked off by everybody, which is great. And so there's plugins for your phone, there's browser plugins, um, and so there's like Spreeder and SpeedRead, and I, you can find this technology and use it. Uh, I'll give you some output. links to put in the, we'll in the show put, notes. We'll put some links How to SpeedRead, we can show yeah, it. Input like, output was the most important kind of thing. Yeah, because like, then you can learn, and then if you're learning how to learn learning. faster and you increase your input and output, you can now learn anything at a very rapid rate. And so any skill you want to learn is becomes more surmountable, and the nootropics actually help you with learning and memory, which is what we're going to see here, even when Let's it's disrupted. It is that these, so these rats go in a cage. Rats will always go to the darkest part of a cage. So they put the rat in this cage, then they like lock him in, they put, the, or they put this red light on, and then they shock the foot. And so they like, it's like a zap, and the rat's like shit. And so if you put him in there the next day, when that light goes on, he'd get the heck out of the, he'll get out of the dark, dark area. area yep. But if you shock their brain, convulsive shock, like they used to do to people in mental institutions, or you give them, a, a suffocate them, which simulates hypoxia, which means a, stro a stroke, causes damage in the brain because you lose oxygen and then there's like glutamate induced neurotoxicity. There's this whole process of memory consolidation that doesn't occur. And so they found like when they suffocate the rat, for example, it only remembers 20% of the time to get out of that area. Yeah. When they gave them paracetam prior, 80%. So they're like, what the heck is going on? And when they, when they did the convulsive shock, it's a, again, less than 20%, but if they gave the rat paracetam prior to the shocking, the wow. convulsive shock, 100% retention. Wow. So they're like, what the hell, next slide. What the heck is going on here? So they pull out this UCB6215. They're like, let's run more tests. They do 30 different classical psychopharmacological tests, which you can see here. They found no sedation, tranquilization, no stimulation, no interference with synaptical transmitters, no acute short-term or long-term toxicity. They found like none of these like weird changes. It only seemed to affect like higher level activity. And when they would like suffocate them and then see how long it takes their brain activity to go back to normal, which is associated with higher level activity is like the first thing to go when you're suffocated. They found that it took like uh, 30 minutes in the control and 17 minutes in the rats who had prastam. So they realized, shit, we've got something on our hands here. And so this is 1963, 64, 65. So you're they giving spend... a rat paracetam before it gets shocked or electroconvulsive shock or suffocated. And then it's when, when it's revisiting the light and the darkness where the area where they get the shock or the, the whatever the, the, it is, they will actually have a much higher rate of not going into that area if they use paracetam exactly. beforehand. Which is so interesting because what are these, what is paracetam? What are these new nootropics that we can use in these situations? They didn't know. So they were like, what the heck is this? Next slide. Um, so this is another one they did. This is what I was talking about. So this, you just took Nupet, which has an even stronger effect on the corpus callosum. So the corpus callosum is the main highway between the two sides of your hemispheres mm -hmm. of your brain. And so this is a cat's uh, electrical activity. This is the control. It's just like wah, 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 wah. Here's, this is 15 minutes, here's 30 minutes. Look at uh, 60 minutes and 90 minutes. You see wah, 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 wah. So that's like much more information circling throughout the networks of the brain. If that makes sense more information circling throughout the networks of the brain. The communication of your brain is increased across that main highway. There's more traffic going on in your brain. Correct. So you're drawing yeah. from area, different areas of your brain yeah. and bringing more information so, in. So my question would be then, have we went under EEG? This is, be, this is uh, there are EEG studies, single dose and long term, and there are changes as well. Um, I don't have those in this, these slides, but there, there are effects. So, and, then, and then under EEG, we're looking at um, more uh, brain activity across hemispheres, across the yeah. whole brain, than without paracetam or without Nupept in this case. Yeah, I actually did a, my, uh, uh, N equals one study. I had a journalist come and we went to a doctor or a scientist and they put an EEG, QEG headset on 
and when in the control, her brain had like a lot of activity like in the outside and like it was like red on this graph, which was like bad. And then after the new pept and then 30 minutes later, her brain was like calm and it was all green and it was like integrated and you had like alpha, better alpha waves and stuff like that. It was neat. Uh, obviously it needs to be replicated, but it, it's pretty cool. I want to put you in a daily study with EEG and neuroscience. I do, I do my own meditation and I wear an EEG headset and I get biofeedback. Yeah, yeah, there's that. But I mean like, let's do a study with like a thousand people that... I'd uh, love to. Yeah. You have the funding. Let yeah, me know. Let, let's, let's do it because I want to see this. Yeah, let's, let's get a next, like, next slide funding here. for this. Um, yeah, so they were like, what the heck is this? Where does this fit into all the drugs we know? And this is the the system of psychotropic drugs that was known by in like the early 1970s and 80s. And so uh, you had psychoanalytics, psycholeptics, psychodysleptics, where you had like the psychomimetics, which was what they originally called psychedelics before psychedelics term was uh, well known. So that's in that own category there. Psychomimetics. Yeah, because it meant uh, simulating psychosis, uh, mm -hmm. actually. If you read the Michael Pollan book, he talks a lot yeah. about these categories. And so you can see uh, the central nervous stimulants, amphetamines and caffeine. So anyone tells you that nootropics are, amphetamine or caffeine are nootropics, it's not there. They're in the, not in the same category. You see nootropics is on its own. Noetic activity, meaning higher level like brain activity. So they have paracetam, eteracetam. Well, because there's also those uh, effects afterward with amphetamines and with caffeine. Is yeah, and well, they're, they're just regulating up your like fight or flight thing. In my book and in the uh, full slides, I have, there's a book called Blitzed. About the, or, uh, about the Nazis taking amphetamine, something called Prevotin, and Jeez. then it makes your fight or flight uh, go up, and so they made them much better soldiers because they're like on the edge of their seat, like firing, which is not what you want. That's actually the like story in my book about how drug development could go wrong, yeah. and then like uh, nootropics are like the savior of it. Um, so this is just like the cat trying to categorize it was difficult, and so they had to propose the next, the own topic. Next slide. No, that's not my book. That's the Cornelia Gurgia. That's, uh, that's Fundamentals of Pharmacology of the Mind, which is, there's only two known copies that are outside a library, and I own both of them. That's one of them. Yeah, uh, what, <laughs> and we're talking what, about your book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Sorry, my uh, bad. it's fine. My book was History of Nootropics. So this, his, this, this was like laid out with all these studies. You can find all the charts like towards the back. Fundamentals to a pharmacology. Cornelia Gurgio, he was a Hungarian neuropharmacologist in Belgium. Some of his writings like in French. Some of it, like this stuff we're talking about is like towards the back over here. Um, there's like the cat EG and paracetam. So that was like uh, the most full description of the nootropic concept and like where they were going with it. Um, and so uh, they basically, he basically, this is from the first paper, he said, a new class is therefore considered for which you propose the term nootropic, noose meaning mind and tropin meaning towards. So they mean towards the mind. It's a class that selectively enhances higher level integrative activity. You know, there's a compound re related to vanilla. That's why old books smell good when they break down. You get that vanilla smell. Uh, What's the comp? I forget you know? the name of it, yeah. but it's related to vanilla. That's why old books smell good. I fucking love uh, old There's like books. 200 something compounds in vanilla, but uh, which is ironic because we think of it as a bland flavor, but it's very complex. When did he? Uh, this when this was is this 19, 1972, and then this hooks back to the whole brain evolution. He said uh, Penfield, uh, Wilder Penfield, was this researcher who says. This integrative activity is probably the main factor in the evolution towards Homo sapiens. So this is where it like links back to that first slide and the evolution of our brain and higher level cognitive activity. And this is like where the human brain is saying that evolution has not, like in the last 50,000 years, our brain has not evolved. It takes millions of years, hundreds of thousands potentially to fully evolve our brain. And so he has a quote, I believe, do we have a quote? Man will not wait passively for millions of years. I don't know if we have it, but it says, man yeah. will not wait passively for millions of years for evolution to offer him a better brain. And yep. that's the concept that truly drives me in nootropics is that we have to take evolution of our brain in hand. Like, yes, I take DHA and all that, but we actually need to like activate our higher level activity to include more neurons, to stimulate neurogenesis and synaptogenesis, yeah. making new synapses, making new neurons, which can be done chemically. Nupep has been shown to raise BDNF, which is a the, which is brain-derived neutrophic factor, um, which is like a growth factor of how many neurons your brain is demanding and it's factory to make. Um, and so that's the kind of thing if we can, it's like going to the gym. If you go to the gym, but you don't eat protein, you'll just catabolize, you'll take muscle and protein from other parts of your body and just put it like in your bicep. But if you add exogenous protein, like from your diet and you just eat protein powder, you just have like 
a, you know, 0.8 to 1.3 grams of uh, grams of protein per pound of body weight, you'll be able to gain muscle mass just from working out because you rip a muscle and then you, you, your body will synthesize new ones. So that's why when you take nootropics, you want to do like, there's studies showing brain training plus nootropics is better than brain training or nootropics alone. So you want to like... So you want to take exogenous forms of enhancing the human mind. Things that stimulate, yeah. evolution isn't just going to sit around. Uh, we're not we don't have wait. time, yeah. We're not going to wait for humans to evolve, get a better brain evolved. We can actually take science by the horns and implement and, it. And on body. top of that, the brain is like is as powerful as more powerful than the most powerful supercomputer we have yet it runs on the power of a light bulb i gave a talk at a hack mm -hmm. hacker conference called hacking the most powerful supercomputer in the universe is about the brain and uh the idea is is that the brain had to be able to operate when it had minimal things like if it didn't say choline for example can you roll the next slide uh okay, well i'll go to in a second can you go one slide forward i believe so we have choline uh yeah so choline is a precursor for acetylcholine. Um, and so- Choline's in the- cell. Choline, acetylcholine is the in other both. ingredient in both those pills. So that's like makes the stack. So that's why profound effects combining choline and paracetam. So we have like a more advanced paracetam and the purest patented uh, cognizant acetylcholine imported from Japan, made in a bioreactor that's a, uh, a free base and not a salt. Like the, if it's not patented, it's a salt form. So this is like- Pure, pure brain fuel. Just taking that in like 15 minutes. Time okay, right? just taking that in human, uh, in human adults, like women, especially postmenopausal women, will increase their cognitive abilities um, uh, in, in 28 days. In healthy adult and healthy males, it also works. The idea is that everybody needs about 500 milligrams of choline a day, and the cholergenic system helps firing. It runs through the hippocampus. It makes us form memory. Taking so just taking this. Uh, the, the choline alone will keep it in the straddle areas. If you have the racetam, the paracetam, the nupep, the phenylparacetam, the real nootropics, they're like the, the gas pedal telling your body to use that tank of new acetylcholine and choline and bring it into the hippocampus where we're forming memory. So that's kind of like this stack and there's a synergy between them. If you hit the next slide, you'll see this is you. You know your shit, which is really Thank you. important. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, so the U.S. is a pre-training. It's a new field, like you were describing, it, it, really recently. It's a fairly exploding. relative yeah. field, especially in healthy people, which we'll go back a couple slides in a minute to those. But so that was saline. That was a control after they've been training. Here was choline alone. There's paracetam alone. Com pa paracetam and choline. Look how the the difference, the magnitude effect, and it, it was so that it. They think in this case, because these were like a dementia population, is that their cholergenic normal memory system is out of whack and just providing the choline won't help them because you don't have the regulation and the enhancement of the brain that the paracetam and the nootropic provides. So in these population, it's like- One more time on the difference between the paracetam, how it puts the foot on the gas pedal and the choline, yeah. how it puts So the choline the is a pedal. fuel for acetylcholine. Acetylcholine, this type of choline we have, also donates uh, lipids uh, to help the brain make new neurons. It donates and cells. lipids for the Every brain cell to make has new acetylcholine uh, or uh, phosphatidylcholine in it, which comes directly from this precursor source. So the choline supply. Neurogenesis uh, helps, helps with. Cellular, yeah, to make new cells, also neurogenesis. But the okay. choline is like the fuel that builds up the like supply. And then okay. the paracetam. paracetam and the nootropic, phenol, whatever, phenylparacetam, we say paracetam like nootropic is the gas pedal telling your brain it's okay to like go a little bit faster. We have all this fuel, implement that in and let's gun it up. And then your brain can, it's not, worried about the dietary limitations of precursors. Okay, so, so it's an increase in supply and then the gas pedal to go. Yes, to go with it. Okay. So you don't want to step on the gas pedal like an amphetamine. It steps on the gas pedal of dopamine without giving you like tyrosine to help build back up the precursor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. So this also okay. like brings it okay. to the area that otherwise it would stay in the straddle outside areas. Okay, so and that's what you got right here is choline That's and what choline and paracetam, those profound effects are found in these pills, hopefully. If you go back two slides now, um, here we have the increase in the power of human memory, a normal man. So this was the first study. This is a study that started the like whole smart drugs thing. This is back in 1976. Mm -hmm. This is the first time that any drug really ever was shown to enhance healthy individuals' brains. So these college students were given paracetam and they, by the second week, this is zero days, seven days, 14 days. 
they, their verbal, their recall, their verbal uh, recall was dramatically improved, statistically significantly improved. So they're like, what the heck? And that's kind of like where, like, I believe the like pop culture, and that was like the first wave of cognitive enhancers, kind of came in. I believe we're now like in the second wave of, of smart drugs and nootropics and cognitive enhancers. But if you go forward now, a couple slides, we're gonna I see wanna here. I want to follow those students longer. I yeah, I don't keep know what happened. Them them but so they kept ex more tests they kept this. experimenting with nootropics, and they're like, what? Because it has all these properties, because it's extremely safe, because it protects the brain and brings back normal activity when it's disrupted. They're like, this is like one of the great wilder ones. Is they did uh, paracetam injected into a pregnant uh, a mother in a labor or a C-section because the baby in there is not getting enough oxygen to its brain, so they either have to operate or they could give the mother prostate, which would go into the baby's brain. And when it went into the baby's brain, Whoa. this is humans, and this was live Whoa. adult, alive, alive babies, they recovered more quickly with the prostate than a C-section. But so they made fun of prostate. Whoa. Yeah. They made fun of prostatam saying this is a drug. Oxygen depletion's going on in the in, the in fetus. a fetus that's not being uh, and, that's and, stuck in the womb and, and not able to come out. Will, the same way those rats recovered more quickly when it had prostatam when they were suffocated. Wow. It protected the babies. It's very interesting. Yeah, and so they use it cool. for in surgery. They would give it to you to come conscious more quickly. They tried it in, in dyslexia and developmental disturbance. Eventually, people are like this is a drug and surgery, they would make fun of it. But other scientists were like, we need to move from the question of efficacy. This shit works. We need to say, where can it be used? used Where's yeah. the therapeutic relevancy? Yeah. And so that's difficult in healthy adults. There's no category medically to use that clinically. And so you cannot use them to get funding for like drug development and anything as, a, as something, an aid for healthy people. And so where it worked well, because our cholergenic system's already flowing well, and that's one of the things that facilitates, it doesn't show like you can't use that to say like, hey, we're gonna enhance these people who are already healthy. So it kind of was like lost for a while. If you go to the next slide, um, you'll see that the in, and so in this intervening time in the next 20 years, there's an evolution of paracetam where they try to make different ones. Awesome. And so here we have aniracetam, which is like a creative, uh, is a more, I would say creative, shorter lasting nootropic. You have oxiracetam, which is kind of works better for some people, for some reason has a sweet taste. Prammy is a more physical one, less cognitive. And then Leveracetam was, uh, became an epilepsy drug. And that's actually why this company stopped working on Paracetam, because Leveracetam had the same energy and electrical activity regulating properties of the brain without the cognitive effects, which would be considered a side effect. It's actually negative in clinical things. If you can't explain an effect, it's not good. So they got one without cognitive properties that still regulated the electrical activity of the brain, and it became a blockbuster uh, anti-epilepsy drug and is its own class of epilepsy drugs in, in the way in which it works. Whoa. Yeah. And then so here's Nupep and phenylparacetam. Helping with epilepsy? The Leveracetam. Yeah, you can, wow. you can check it out if you have epilepsy. So then they made, so I'm, I'm going faster because we're short on time here, but mm. so Nupep and phenylparacetam were then made actually, and both of them were made in different labs in Russia. Phenylparacetam was because they wanted one for Russian cosmonauts, yeah. astronauts in space, uh, Russian astronauts in space, to uh, increase their physical activity without cracking them out because they're in this little exactly. tiny thing. Yeah. Also say there was a loss of oxygen in the space pod, what's well, gonna help their brain go back to normal better? Paracetam. Mm. Also, if you're slowly losing oxygen or being poisoned by like carbon dioxide, you go mentally insane. And so this would prevent the disruption if something happened. And the longest spacewalk at the time in the early 90s was 179 days, and the, astronaut, the cosmonaut was on phenylparacetam during his trip. And then Nupep was made because they want, and it, phenylparacetam is banned for Olympic athletes and uh, the IOC, International Olympic Committee, and World Anti-Doping Agency for, and these are again considered, if you're going for the cognitive properties, these would be side effects, is increased endurance and, physical, and uh, resistance to cold. So those are like the side, cool side effects. Um, so that one's why I say that one's like more physical and it gives you like greater awareness in space. And Nupep is a dipeptide form. So a peptide is a short chain of amino acids, uh, but they're very easy for the body to absorb and peptides or dipeptides are stronger. So that you can see they've moved the paracetam. There's paracetam plus a phenyl group. There's a paracetam. Here's a paracetam split on two sides of this molecule onto like a structural component of the brain, what's called vasopressin, and it's considered a thousand times stronger by molecular weight. And it also has like anti-anxiety and anxiolytic properties as they call. So they're like, this thing's more powerful 
and it has a side effect of like getting you more zen. And that one is extensively studied in people with uh, post uh, concussion to help like regrow the brain and like the repair. And also for uh, pre dementia people to like keep them going well. So people say like, what are the? So it actually prevents the onset of disease. Yeah. So yeah, there's a study. So this is what people say is what's the long term effects of nootropics? And it's like there's a study, uh, one year long, placebo control, double blind. Uh, ha- the placebo, they were given 14 different psychometric tests, like test their brain activity. What's today's date? What's this going on? Do this math problem. What's the shape I just told you two questions ago? Stuff like that. And the people who were on, pra- not on the placebo, they went down on nine out of the 14. These are pre-dementia. So they're like 650 and 60 and they're aging over this year. Yeah. And there had to be have some issue that they're starting to realize their brain is going, that they were in the study. The people on paracetam only went down on one. That's pretty intense. Yeah, it's pretty nuts. So when yeah. people say, what's the long-term effects? That's when I say, if we don't end aging or die trying, like our brain is going to decline. So like our only yeah. hypothesis is that our brains are going to go. So if we can protect our brains, we should be taking nootropics as early as possible, potentially. So cool. we're going to look real quickly at Unifram and Sunifram um, and the next slide, uh, which is basically like how we kind of like got to the biohacker, like how, how nootropics came to me. Um, again, like through the internet. And so this is a, st- this, so this Unifram and Sunifram are partner molecules. Unify is the, the name of the university in Florence. It's like the college name, symbol name. Like if UCLA, Unify is, is University of Florence. And so this guy was studying nootropic derivatives in around 2008. And he found this like whole class and he and, and had all these properties. But because of the financial crisis, they stopped the development, they didn't patent it, all these things. And this scientist is sitting there years later and he gets an email from someone on the internet saying, hey, like, what's the optimal dosing for humans for these things? And the guy's like, uh, who, what the hell is going on? And doesn't respond or anything. And then he gets a message from the guy like a few months later saying, hey, I've got some of this stuff. Uh, I'm taking this dose six times a day for the total of that. Um, I've not spent one second tired. I've lowered my sleep. And uh, he's and this scientist goes in and Google's a compound. He's like, holy shit, you could buy this like from China. It's all available on the internet. And he's like, whoa, like this has never been tested in humans. Like the ones I have have been tested in humans. I personally don't take these because they don't have extensive testing and post marketing surveillance where they've been on the market for ten or twenty years wow. where things become apparent. Yeah. But there are more experimental things. And so holy cow, this yeah. guy is like, holy We're shit. Moving forward with experiments. Yeah, he's saying yeah. from the lab to the web, and he's saying yeah. there's a shortcoming academically and industrially where like this thing potentially is safe because it's being used. It could have worked, but because they didn't patent it, because of all these things, yep. now I'm not making any money on it. It was lost to science, the potential for this thing, and now it's out there. And it's like, so that, that is showing these scientists are even aware now that people are furthering their research and taking it and having them synthesized, and they're going out there. So the biohacker lab rats who are willing to experiment, which taking these I wouldn't say is a super experiment because they're like pretty much proven to be safe. Uh, but there are people who are willing to take like crazier outside ones. You can ask me about like C60 fullerenes and stuff if we have time. And the government is actually trying to figure out how to put their feet in to regulate, their arms in to regulate. But at the same time, it's difficult because you don't want to impede innovation. You want to let people biohack and science and figure it out. I don't know what their true stance is, but these things, if they're safe, and consenting adults who know what they're taking should be able to like try yeah. to augment themselves positively. Totally. If they're being That's drugged, really these important. things don't get you high. Yeah. There's no dose that will like get you high. Like they're just, they just are like to help you be a better person. And it'd be a shame to ever have that stopped. And so I try to responsibly bring nootropics to, to the, the world, world and to like have super pure. I don't use any fillers or excipients. There's no like silica in there. There's literally like pure nootropics, just those ingredients. And it's, it takes a lot of effort to get those there, but I have doctor's offices buying them it. because they don't have, want to go to a compounding facility. They can't even get this formula. So if you go to the next slide, I believe we're done with that. This is kind of the wrap up that to be a true biohacker and to really hit true optimal performance, it's not just about taking this pill. It's, a, it's about like that brain training plus the pill, like the way the bodybuilders like yeah. supplement plus the activity. Totally. You need cardiovascular so, exactly, exercise. Exactly. If you increase the ATP energy turnover in your brain, which paracetam will also increase, you need physical exercise. You need mental exercise. Some meditation. You need, you need so diet. I recommend down. like a ketogenic diet. Ketogenic Burning diet. fat is a much more stable fuel. Yeah. Getting sleep is when you, tr- you do long-term potentiation. You transfer memories from short-term to long-term. Yeah. You consult when your muscles are moving and they burn, they have lactic acid that can be cleared out through the lymphatic system. We just discovered a couple of years ago something called the glymphatic system, similarly named in the brain, these channels that clear out 
um, and get rid of the metabolites, which cannot be cleared like the muscles can do while you're awake. You have to be asleep, asleep. to have that happen. So you're going to build up junk in your brain if you don't sleep. Plus, Nupet has a charge on it that makes little particles in your brain clump together, which then can then be excavated from your brain uh, by your like your by these like brain things. Neutral protocol. And I love it. I love how it's in the shape of an atom too. Well, it's like yeah. a five thing because you yeah. really any of the ones you could do will help, but they're all like there's also like exercise plus nootropics. There's meditation plus exercise. You totally, know, so there's, totally. There's all these overlaps. But this is a really crazy important combination, like you wrote here and made it. I like that illustration a lot. I appreciate that. Are we on the way to climate mitigation? Shall yeah, we? Yeah, I believe it's next. Let's do it. All yeah. right. So, so that's a lot on nootropics, and we covered. Um, you know, we did. The, we did definitely did the Cliff Notes version of nootropics. But um, your book will be out in the next few months. In the next few months, the book will be out. That'll be part one, um, the history of nootropics, and then you'll be able to dive into more of kind of like what's going on today, and also what's and going on in the future. With all the like history of those yes. molecules and stuff is cool. Um, so, so we got that coming out in a few months. That'll be exciting. And you, when, when that goes live, we'll definitely be um, promoting as well. That'll be a lot of fun. And then, okay, so that's on nootropics. And that's on like, you know, guys, like go and test yourselves and like see what happens when. I'll give you, you a code for discount take. for your users we'll, as well. well. We'll get a discount code I'll just put simulation in, in. I'll make it simulation. It'll we'll give make you it some, simulation as a discount, discount code. It'll be in the bio. Um, so definitely go and take a try at what it feels like um, for all of these last decades. Decades of research and experience. Go and try it out now. And you right. get you'll get acute effects, short-term, single-dose effects. But the statistically significant we see is between seven and fourteen days. But yeah. give it a whole month's worth to get the full full story, and three months. Yeah, real, give it a go. The real really go. Want to get into it. So Eric's also very polymathic, as you can tell. He's not only understanding about the human body and the very deep nuances of the anatomy and the physiology, but he also cares a lot about a ton of other things. And so one of the things that you've made is a think tank to mitigate climate change. And this is anthropogenic climate change. Yeah. So this is specifically us increasing Human the parts caused. per million of CO2. Well, CO2 specifically, and, yes. And so one of the things um, that, you've, that you've discovered in climate mitigation is this beautiful thing called olivine. And you have an olivine <laughs> yeah, necklace, necklace on, necklace there, which, is, the tree of life. which is awesome. So um, now, Olivine actually helps is us remove CO2. So, so olivine, yeah. So olivine is a very common rock. It makes up sixty to eighty percent of the mantle, um, and it's also the birthstone. The gemstone quality version is known as peridot. Is the August birthstone. But what you may not know about this rock, which is seemingly common, is that when it is exposed to process called weathering is when the rock meets the environment, there's CO2, humidity, erosion, water, yeah. erosion is a part of this, this process as well. Yeah. In the weathering of the rock, there's a reaction with olivine, with CO2 that creates a bicarbonate solution. So it takes the CO2, implements into this alkaline solution, uh, and that event, depending on where it is, so uh, example, if you put these rocks in the ocean, if they're, when they're ground up, they will uh, sequester carbon eventually into the clay and, and soil on the, on the sea floor. And so what's interesting is that 99% uh, of carbon in the world, not CO2, but carbon, the element, is actually already in rock. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't have that little chart here, but uh, I like that chart. limestone, I should've, yeah, I should've, I should've got that for you, limestone, and uh, like other dolomites. dolomites, yes, good call. Dolomites. It's because of the contain, paracetam. Yeah, there you go. You got the, <laughs> your brain's firing there. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so the rock is mostly uh, sequestering all the carbon on Earth already. Yeah. So it makes a lot of sense to put it back in there. And so we know that the process of weathering of olivine, especially when it's accelerated, can change the temperature because the current, current cooling glycation period that we're in, which we are causing a warming, but as a macro trend, we are in a cooling period in the global time scale. When the Himalayan mountains and the uh, Tibet plateau raised up, it actually exposed so much of this uh, rock of olivine and uh, type of rock that it caused a global cooling. And so we know it works on a global scale to modify the temperature. And so that's so nuts. Okay. So now uh, olivine can actually be laid out over 2% of the world's most active um, yes. ocean front Exactly. Beaches. It would take a, a volume of seven kilometers cubed of olivine poured onto the world's 2% most active beaches. Part of it is that every 
if you had to grind up the rock itself, that CO2 would be calculated away from your ultimate sequestration of CO2. So we're going to use free tidal waves, the ty tidal yeah. energy, and the wave motion to grind up the olivine. This is a natural and olivine And that will beach. sequester CO2 into the rock. Into the seafloor, and then uh, things like lugworms and these things on the seafloor will eat it, and then they poop out basically uh, limestone rock. They poop out like rock that eventually settles into like the, the ground. And so that's, there's three other things, three things it does. So it's so that carbon in solution uh, is alkaline, so it also deacidifies the ocean in the immediate area. And then one of the other breakdown metabol uh, is uh, silicate, which when it is other further process, or it's a silica, which becomes silicate, which is a limiting factor for diatoms, which are a form of plankton, which are like the food for the full uh, uh, ecosystem and food totally. chain, is the basis of the food chain. So you have a basis of for um, marine food chain for also photosynthesis. In yes, general, exactly. The, for the fact how we actually have oxygen to breathe, seventy percent of it comes exactly. from exactly. So you get that. I haven't calculated the full uh, phytoplankton effect, or that has not been calculated because there's a number of scientific papers. We put olivine weathering, olivine for sequestration, carbon sequestration, and ocean acidification. There's a number of papers that this project is based off of, and they've done the math all the way out, pricing a ton. <coughs> pricing a ton of olivine from the port of Rotterdam for 23 euros. And they believe at mm -hmm. scale you could get it down to 10 euros per ton. Each ton of olivine that uh, breaks down sequesters 1.25 tons of carbon. So the average American yeah. puts out around 18 to 20 tons of carbon a year. Damn. So that'd be like $180 to $200 something dollars yeah. uh, to, not, to get rid of your whole bad. carbon. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. It's kind of cool uh, because the other options like uh, carbon capture and like uh, is, is around 40 to 50 to $100 per ton. Per ton. And so that's what the Paris Climate Accord is based off of. And so we're pretty mm -hmm. much screwed uh, if that is the only solution we have. And so we need cheaper uh, carbon cheaper sequestration. Carbon sequestration. Per ton. People say like, what about growing trees? But if you, the trees will sequester carbon, in the, in the, especially in their first few years, but then you have to monitor those trees from pests, parasites, fire. If those trees then burn, all that 50 years you spent sequestering, it's gonna go back in. You actually have to like grow the trees, cut them, and then like put them in a mine underground, which is actually like how our trees originally, how we originally got oil and coal deposits were in the early parts of the world, there was no fungi to break down trees, the ligands in the tree, and so trees piled up, and then they eventually got crushed under pressure, and then volcanic activity made them into coal. Coal, interesting. So it's actually like, that is just repeating the same process. So I don't want to do that. I think that it, like, if we could get this these beaches- This is why you have a whole climate mitigation. You have a whole think tank around mitigating climate change, human caused climate change, and how to do this. And again, you are very articulate about knowing your shit regarding this. Okay, so then there's climate mitigation, and then you're just in general, a very- Go to the next slide, yeah. Yeah, let's show the next slide. It was and, just a rock breakdown. Yep. That was like them rolling the rock. That was a natural beach, by the way, Papakolea in Hawaii, which from volcanic activity has green sand already. We know it's safe. What's going to happen is the beach that we'll make will be a tourist attraction as well. So we'll go visit this cool. beach. We're going to sell necklaces like this and other ones that will, it'll be like 200 bucks and it'll offset your whole year's CO2. They're very inspirational so, yeah. too because people get to walk around and say that this is what sequesters carbon. So it becomes a conversational piece It becomes as well. a, be a belief, a belief that we can, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> so, sorry, a belief that we can uh, reverse climate change. Because it gives us hope. That's the point. The, yes, and yeah, exactly. Now, now there's what olivine actually looks like after it gets rounded and polished after the motion as well. Okay, so that's climate mitigation and um, Project Vesta, and we'll put again links in yeah. the bio for people to check out. It's called um, Project Vesta because Four Vesta is a second largest proto planet body in the asteroid belt, and it is happens to be made of olivine. Um, and so, uh, sorry about that. The olivine, if they recall twice, it's going through, I guess. Uh, the olivine is, uh, uh, is, is what Earth formed from those rocks. That body was what Earth crashed together, and that's where like, a lot of our olivine came from. So it's, it's pretty neat. So, okay, so now um, you also had the pleasure of working on a team that was put together through Reddit to work on the Hyperloop project. Yeah. Um, you authored a Medium post called X Without Y. Yes, yeah, so really I'm a futurist as futurist, well. You know, future, yep. Looking at the future, I love technology and like part of the reason I want to live a long time is so I can see the technological Likewise, change. Likewise, advancement, yeah. Um, and that's also one of the reasons I want to 
people say, aren't you all over? I'm like, no, because if I'm going to live 150, 200 years or something, I'm going to have to deal with the planet that we're creating today. And so it's not my grandchildren's problem. It's not my great, great grandchildren's problem. It's my problem. So when you litter that cup, oh, when no. you release that CO2, that's some CO2 I'm going to have to work on sucking back in. And so I, it is all integrated. Whereas like, if you want to live a long time and the last thing to go would be your brain, I want to protect the brain. If the yeah, planet's going yeah. to be a problem, I want to protect the planet. So these are all kind of integrated um, into totally. being, uh, you know, future forward thinking. Uh, Very is, long now perspective. Yeah, it's a long now perspective, slow do. ticks of the clock. But I yeah. want to make sure that I, the world in the future is desirable, exactly. that I have my brain to enjoy it, yes. and that I'm not like an old, decrepit person, which yes. is also like why a biohack and take you know some, some more advanced things. We are two futurists here on the show. We yes, care I, so I believe much you are about, a good futurist. About yourself. building that bright, powerful future for everyone. Now, um, this X without Y, you and I hilariously when we were at. So this um, is two Indie years. Bio, this is two. two this years is July. Later. I wrote this article in July 18, 2016, uh, because I was going to the Indie Bio uh, demo days, which are biotechnology uh, accelerator, and they had like after I would I've been for the two years, the two or three demo days prior, totally. which is one every six months, and I kept seeing this like there was like cows and they were taking cells from them then generating uh, meat, meat based yeah. on that. So there's like meat without the cow. Then they were yeah. using like a mushroom to like grow like a leather-like leather. material. So it was like yeah. leather without a cow. Then they had breast milk in a bioreactor yeah. without a breast. breast. And so you, and you had wine with the, they're analyzing the chemistry of the wine yeah. and then just making it. So it's wine without grapes. Yeah. So I was like, wow, this is, an, this is a time Trend. two years ago when yeah. Uber for X and blah, blah, blah was like such a, a business model where you have the maids where Uber for, you know, there were maids for like, so that Uber for X model was very prominent. And I was like, well, I see this new model in biotech, yep. where, which is like X without Y, like that breast milk without the breast, the leather cow without leather. There's, and there's a bunch of other examples. And wood without trees, which And so just then happened. two years later, yeah. uh, I'm we, at the we thing and these out. guys are using like Lindgrove. ligands of a, of a certain type of flax. uh, flax seed. Yeah, yeah. good memory out of the flax. And they're like stringing it out and you can make this like chair that's like cast out of wood it fibers. It's super amazing. strong. It's super amazing. Strong. Yeah. And I look at their freaking uh, wood without look, their, trees. Their tagline that's is so wood funny. without trees. That's so so as a futurist, to see a prediction come to fruition, it was like very meta for me. And so I yeah. love that. And it's like when you're predicting the future or putting something out there, you don't know that it's going to come true. That's You're almost like speculating yeah, in a way or, yeah. or making an observation that may, may or may not be like a real thing per se, but it has proven to be now this real uh, observation. So. Yeah, and that's always great as a futurist, putting something out there and then seeing if it actually comes true in the next couple of months or years, and there that, it is. That's kind of like the Hyperloop stuff. If you go back for the Hyperloop, um, let's wrap. Let's, let's wrap. wrap on that let's real wrap. quick. Can we wrap on that? Because it's about the cool, cool, looking cool, at the future. Quick, so let's do it. Yeah. The Hyperloop pod is a was a said in passing by Elon Musk at a uh, a talk he was giving a fireside chat about how he was stuck in traffic and he imagined this like uh, fifth mode of transportation. And so people got hyped on it and eventually they like proposed a student competition. Yep. People on Reddit in the comment section on SpaceX said hey, I think we could do this. And we made like a Slack channel and then we got over 150 people. And this is two years after that, we were, uh, we had, were the only non-student comp people left from, from 1,000 applicants to 130 to a design competition to 20 people winning the design competition. We were one of them. So this is two years later, bringing our pod to SpaceX headquarters to compete. And so I always say- In a non-student organization, a non -student, that's pretty cool. Distributed around the world, 15, yeah. 20 countries. 20 teams left. Engineers, people stay, and it was amazing. Like, and when this, this headline is separate from this image, when we met at the design competition, it was the first time when I went and got a guy, flew in from India, never been to the US before, and nobody on the team had ever met in person. I went and found him because he was like, where am I? And we yeah. got him. It was the first time anyone met. There's a, there's a picture in that article. But, and this is to end on this, is that so interesting. being a futurist, people say, why are you doing the Hyperloop? What's the point of it? Like, you're not a business, it's not even a business. Like, how are you, you know, what, why? What, what is the point? And I go, one day when I'm riding in a Hyperloop, I'm going to know the future is here because this technology was invented under my watch and I helped in some small way yeah. make this come to fruition. Totally. And so that yeah. is like the idea of being a futurist is like to help, uh, my job is to help accelerate the future forward, to bring us the future more rapidly. And there's like, I call this thing in one of my writings called the slack, that we're in this, this, this time like slack and I liken it to 
being, and I'll leave it with this metaphor, is like being behind a boat. And when you're there, you get the water skis up, and you're like, you're sitting there, and you got the three leg, you give a thumbs up to the boat, like I'm yeah. ready to go. But in that moment, you're still sinking down there, and there's slack in the line, and it's not tight, and the boat is taken off. You can see the boat has moved, but you're there like sinking, and it seems like you're in the worst time, like you're about to drown, you're like struggling to bob your head above water, and then suddenly the slack pulls out of the line, and you're now hydroplaning like magic above the water. And so I believe that we're in like a technological slack where our inventions and our things that we're making have not caught up to the reality that we exist in today to, that will bring those technologies forward. And so part of the way you can beat the, bring the, you know, take the slack out of the line is to pull the rope shorter. And so as a futurist, in terms of bringing this information out there and helping people like experience the future, they, when they believe the future's here and the, there's like the aesthetics of the future, like having even a futuristic haircut, it makes yeah. it look futuristic. When you yeah. look around, you want it to be futuristic. And so that's kind of like, as a futurist, the goal is to help pull the slack out of line. And I think here at Simulation, you're doing that, and I try to do that myself. I think you do. And I think you do a great job of it. And it's always a pleasure to be able to host very multidisciplinary people on the show. And that's why I'm very grateful to have you as my friend and as someone that is uh, building the future. And you're doing that with Neutro, doing that with Climate Mitigation. I did that with the Hyperloop. So it's a pleasure to have you on the show, Eric. Thank you. Thank oh, you so much it. for coming on the show. Um, we'll have to get to some of the other simulation questions at another time. Um, that will be a lot of fun. So just to review everyone, um, we'll have a promo code in the bio for you uh, to order up some nootropics from Neutro and give it a go and let us know your thoughts. We'd love to hear about it. Also, um, do check out uh, Climate Mitigation, join the think tank as well. Um, subscribe, join our family with simulation and leave us a comment of what you thought. Share the content with other people around you. We'd love to get more people talking and building with this. So whether you go out and create with it, so go make a video about it, go and write about it, go and talk to other people about it, start a company about it, you know, go do your thing, go create with it. And join us on Patreon if you'd like. We really need to continue help supporting the studio and growing this process, so that would be greatly appreciated. Thanks, everyone. Much love. Ron Vargas, our producing partner and director. All right, everyone. Peace. Hehehehe <laughs>